I know that we may be crossed on time, or I hope I haven't run out so I can take some questions. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you for uh, your insights and your wisdom that you shared with us tonight. Um, I got a press release from the Republican Club of Florida, uh, Republican Party of Florida, excuse me, uh, that was sort of alarming. I got it Monday, uh, shared with some friends, uh, and spoke about the state's decision, uh, what you need to make, uh, and this relates to you, uh, concerning uh, the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, when we have to expand our rules <coughs> of, uh, of Medicaid. And uh, the governor put somewhere between eight billion and twenty-six billion of unknown amount of money. And isn't that from since uh, the Supreme Court said uh, the uh, the states are not mandated to do this, we're not going to hold your Medicaid money back. But it's your decision. If you're going to expand Medicaid, you're going to get a one-time grant, and then it's up to you. Could you uh, tell us? What I'll try. I'll doing? try. I'll try because I don't. I uh, I don't believe there has been. I don't believe there has been a decision on. Uh, that they will, they will ultimately decide that uh, in the upcoming legislative session. Uh, and uh, in fact, when I had, had, had spoken with the governor yesterday, he had referred to his conversations with uh, uh, Captain Sevillas that he said, "I'm willing to listen, but your team has to come to me and show how this act will reduce the cost of care and improve the quality of care." And I don't want to be uh, quoted or as quoting the governor, but his point was that uh, that was his thinking, that, that I understand that it was passed, I understand that what the Supreme Court has said, and I understand I take an oath to the Constitution, and so now make your argument to me that I should do this. Because yes, it's, uh, the Supreme Court said to us that this is what exists, this, all of this that is the Affordable Care Act is out here, but when it comes to this Medicaid expansion, the states, you can't force that upon the states. They will make that call. And I don't believe that decision has been made. So, that so, be, so if, if they decide to take the federal money and expand Medicaid, right. we don't know what it's going to cost us. Well, here is what I see as the concern. Um, remember when I said that budget went from $74 billion to $69 is now at $70? That is, I'm, I'm, those are real dollars that I'm talking about. And in that period, if you don't think that that would have been difficult, say, well, it was 70. But remember, each one of those years, Medicaid was still growing, and there was still a responsibility to pay for that. So that meant every year something else had to be reduced so that we could keep the overall spending down. Uh, Medicaid, that one, $70 billion budget, that one line item, the one line item is $22 billion for Medicaid that is meant to be available to any of our fellow Americans on a given day when they are so down and out that they need someone else's assistance. Medicaid is not meant to be permanent. Uh, so, it's a permanent entitlement, let me again state this for the record, but the idea was is that people would enter and then get back up on their feet and then they'd move, they'd move again. Uh, so, um, so presently, we're almost at a 50-50 split on this. So that means the present Medicaid system, when someone when someone goes to, and gets health care coverage under Medicaid, the state, you as Florida taxpayers, pick up a 50 cent of that dollar, and the federal government, you as federal taxpayers, that's where your other 50 cents come from. Yeah. Don't you love when someone says, but it's a federal dollar. Yeah, yeah, well, most of it. So under the new, what the, the sales job is, is that on the new, but we'll pay for 100% of it. So don't worry, state, it's 100% federal, which of course still means you're paying for it, 100%. Yeah, it's just not coming out of that treasury versus the other. And then they say that in a few years down the road, we'll go to a 90-10 split. Well, remember that the full program is at 50-50. There's gonna be a day down the road when someone's gonna say, hey, well, that 90-10 thing, let's make it 80-20. And then it's 73rd. And I think that's where, again, people put air saying, um, we are where we are today. This is where we are at this moment. And we would have to see the case that, that we wouldn't ultimately be expanding Medicaid significantly and then slowly see those dollars move away and that the Florida taxpayer would be on the, on the hook for recovering them. So it, it has not been decided. Yes? Oh, I want to thank you so much oh, for being here, and uh, also, um, to me, your 
we're preaching we're, we're preaching to the to the choir. When I want to know when is your next chance to give this same um, extremely informative, intelligent package of knowledge to people who don't want to know. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, now, the reason that I came as soon as I was asked is, believe it or not, there are not many people that are calling to hear the, the CFO of the state be invited to their club. Uh, I think the Rotary has other people that they invite, uh, so I don't get normal many too many speaking engagements. But uh, there are there are opportunities uh, that we will we will have. Uh, to speak to economic councils or chambers and the like, there are, there are, there are a few times that I'm that I'm offered the occasion to speak, maybe in all, in, in front of audiences that that uh, um, would think to invite me. Maybe there's a reason that they are not. I don't know. <laughs> but what? Let me go back to again how Dennis began that conversation. You gave me four years. You only gave me four years. The, you know and. And, and people will have a chance to, to call it a second time. I, I, and I'd like a second time, but that's not tonight's conversation. But, but so, so I can decide, and right now I've decided I'm gonna take advantage of every second I have. And uh, so they're, they're getting what they, uh, what, well, what the opportunity I have, and, and we'll make the most of it. But, but it, it, wherever I get the opportunity, to, I, if we put out a newsletter, it's called Dollars and Cents, and uh, I was pretty clear last week what I thought about the fiscal cliff deal. Uh, and that went to everybody that subscribes to that. Uh, so, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, th uh, thank you, Mr. Outlaw, for appearing tonight and speaking to the uh, sure. people. Now, briefly, uh, if I, I may have misunderstood, uh, basically, what responsibilities do you have for state owned properties? Ah, okay. This is, this is a really good question. The question was, what responsibilities do I have for state-owned properties? I have the responsibility that there is, uh, under the risk management header, that there, there is insurance. If there is a building on that piece of property, most of you were self-insuring it, but I do have reinsurance in place over it because there's catastrophic events. Uh, equipment, the, the fleets that, that that the Department of Transportation may drive out on the highway, that you would see those trucks. That are they insured? Are they covered? Are they properly uh, covered? Um, state lands. Uh, if I might say this, there we're trying. I, I want to get a handle on that for you. Uh, uh, this. Uh, let me let me come right back to that. Um, when I had, as I mentioned before, that brief moment to be, uh, it's a two-year term, but you had the privilege of serving as your Senate President. Uh, we would ask questions, well, what do we own? Uh, well, we really can't tell you. Uh, and uh, so we have the Department of Forestry that owns land. We have the Department of Biome Protection that owns land. Um, we have uh, uh, a couple of other agencies that own land. And there are some of that land is available for you to take a hike on and, and, and get out and enjoy some quiet time on. Some of it's parkland. Some of it is a conservation plan. There are still cattle on it, but, but we now own it. Uh, some of it you can't get on. Uh, all these different agencies are running out um, and managing them. I want to be careful. You may think of managing may not be the same definition of someone else's term, but so imagine that there are two parcels of land uh, and one Department of Environment Protection runs out and mows and, and it's right next door to one that's owned by forestry and next week they're running out there and taking care of that parcel next door to it. But nobody could tell us how much we had. So we, we are putting together a system right now that will help us see all that we have. So in this ongoing dialogue about, um, and, and water is an issue for Florida long term. It is an issue for Florida. So how do we look at, rather than assuming that we have to keep acquiring everything that comes on the market or everything that we might call as, uh, as, a, as a particular environmental value, well, what, is, what do we have in this inventory? Is there anything that can be surplus? Should this be on the marketplace? Is this of any, this, is a, does this piece of property truly have any environmental value? Or is it one that we acquired that came along with a piece that was along the river, but it's 80,000 acres or 50 acres or 70,000 acres, whatever. So we're going through that inventory now so that we can we can answer that question. But up until 
up at this very moment, I cannot tell you the answer to that question. Yes? Um, I'm fortunate enough to work for um, Labor Finders, a company started by an entrepreneur that has headquarters here in Florida, and we have a whole lot of offices here in Florida, and a temporary staffing agency. Any given day, we employ over 60,000 people minimum in temporary labor. And our newest office is in Bismarck, North Dakota. Hey, all right. That means it. And they're doing, uh, they're really doing excellent. I'm really proud that we help employ Americans in jobs. And my question is, I used to live in California and Arizona and Las Vegas, New Mexico, and all those places. They all had agencies designed to take jobs from Californians I mean, to take businesses from California, which wasn't hard to do because of their enormous taxes. What What is Florida doing now to bring industry here? Because it's we don't seem to have much. I see. Really good question. That's a really good question. There is. Um, I, I would really like to give credit here to uh, Governor Scott. He is really. <laughs> he has. Um, uh, and I've, again, watched this a little while, uh, for a couple of years. And we've called this Enterprise Florida, that's a name you may have caught in the paper, or uh, 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 there's been other terms for, for different things that we have done to attract, but primarily the header has been, or the agency lead agency has been uh, Enterprise Florida, which is, that's the one that is out telling our story and identifying people uh, who are operating something, consider Florida. Look at Florida, um, see Florida. And what's important about that conversation is there are very, there, there are tremendous, um, there are really valuable enterprises here in Florida that have never been given an incentive. They chose here, they built it here, they, they, this is all they ever knew, and, and we need to be doing everything we can to be sure this is the right environment for them to succeed. At the same time, there are certain types of uh, industries, manufacturing industry, or certain life sciences that would bring additional intellectual capital here. That would help diversify our economy for a far longer view down the road. So we would move a little bit away from some of the investment in tourism, not diminish it, but just the next investment might not be in tourism, might not be in ag per se, agriculture per se, but might be to attract a life science player that can create and venture capital that will follow here, attract other talent that would, would come here and grow here and, and have spinoffs here. So they really are doing a very good job now. It, I would say it was somewhat suspect, but I do believe that Governor Scott has done a very good job and been very, very focused. He's not throwing around dollars. You know, you, you don't see him running around trying to give a check to just come here. It's a pretty hard bargain. This is what Florida has to offer. And, and one thing, again, I go back to this point. So many people would still say, boy, if you were only more like California, uh, or, uh, we, it, yes, it's been true. We had to do a lot in education. We have a lot to go in education. But we're now seeing results of our learning gains of our kids that when someone looks at Florida, they're not looking at a state that was bottom in the nation. Um, and yet, today, it's still a fight. People are still wrestling with, but I wish we didn't have all this accountability in education. Well, it's your child's future. Let's, 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 okay, it's a fair argument, but let's debate it, but let's not say, again, it's ugly. It's, it's all in place because your child's future matters. And just spending a dollar is not my expression of how much I care about your child. I won't just spend a dollar. I want to know that there's a learning game for you. I'm sorry to get off on that, but, but I, I, Rick Scott is really concerned about diversifying our economy, but being sure that the local businesses that are here could use the incentive to grow again, just as much as trying to attract someone to grow from someplace else. He's really trying to watch that. Yes, sir. I want to say one other question. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> it's coming up on, uh, on 10 years uh, since the Scripps deal was done. And yeah. State and the county put a lot of money in that, and Scripps, you know, is, as themselves are doing okay, and Max Planck is here. But from a measurements point of view, he said being accountable and so forth. Right. How would you rate the Scripps deal for the money expended and the uh, and how, how, you know, what, what do you look at? Yeah, right. Um, the scripts is hit, um, uh, and I think y'all heard, heard the question, as much talk about us, and, and it was a very, uh, and, and certainly in financial terms, a very rich deal, yeah. transaction. Uh, the county put in a significant amount of dollars, and uh, some of the local municipalities put up some dollars in, in land, and the state put up significant dollars. 
this was uh, uh, there has been there's not been a um, a transaction since that was anything close to that transaction and the, and the decision there and I I really do wish to still uh, without hesitation give Governor Bush he looked at this and said the only way that we have that we serve we um, during the next economic cycles that will, will surely come as they always do those cycles that will come how can we begin to diversify the economy so that, it, that when people choose not to come here because they can't sell the house because of the recession that jobs are still here and if they're not coming for, for tourism these jobs are still created here and if it's not an ag job as the world begins to create and you know this is taking place um, vegetables and fruits that far lower cost than America because of the environmental issues that, that we're holding farming to that, that other countries are not. That industry is going to be hard. So he really went out to seed something and he knew and he spoke with, uh, with expecting that people would hold him accountable but would say this one to start seeding a movement to life sciences as an industry in Florida I have to do more for this. They've hit all the benchmarks for jobs created internally and the fact that Burnham Research would choose Florida because they saw that Florida was serious. That still was an incentive to bring Burnham here. It was still an incentive to bring Mox Plank here. Tory Pines came with an incentive. But, but all by themselves, they would never have come had there not been the seeding of the original. And I would think that is a fair question. That was somewhat of a... Uh, of an 03, 04 transaction at the time it was put together. I, I do think it's fair to, for the marketplace to say to us, you know, you, you really need to come back to us and share with us what's next. About it. Tell us really, did you, did you, has the follow up been is, and met the expectations? I would say there would still have been a, a higher expectation that more would have occurred in economic activity around it in life sciences that we have seen, but I, I would, I would not uh, say that that is um, has not been a uh, been a valued investment for the state of for the people of Florida. That we have to diversify our economy. It was it was an expensive one, but I believe in the long term uh, that if you could think about again Florida having now a Burnham, a Mox Plank, a Tory Pines and what's going to grow here uh, over the next 15 to 20 years. I really believe that. I'm, um, I'm, I'm still comfortable that, that the, uh, the diversification was the right thing to do. Uh, Jeff, yeah. uh, how many more questions are you uh, able to take? Longest, okay, uh, great, yeah. excellent. Thank you. Jeff, just a quick question. It's kind of a follow-up to that and the one before. There's a lot of really overburdensome regulations placed on businesses, both large and small. Is the state doing anything to maybe help reduce those so it's easier for someone to set up a business and you know make a buck and be profitable? Yeah, and that's a really important question. You know, the easy answer is that every one of us who gets a chance to stand in front of you is first off tells you as a candidate, I'm going to go after that, and then they're going to say how good they've done at it. Uh, this is a big deal, though. This is really the big deal. Um, and again, let's give uh, these, this last year, uh, one of those things that Rick Scott promised he would do, he now did create what's called the one stop. You can go to one place for your permitting, and that place is to be responsible for going to all the other places with and for you. That if, if, if you have something that, that might be involved with agriculture, but it might also be involved in health, you're not gonna be expected to route yourself through all this maze. That's one step. You come here and we start the fight, and we, and we go to solve this with you. That's been established, and that's a really big deal. Uh, by, by his count, and I, and I have no reason to disagree, that, that what happens is, I think you're familiar, a law is passed, and then the agency that is, in, that is charged with the law to implement it writes what they call as rules. Okay? So that's where you would, uh, uh, and we used this one the other day, that uh, we went to see what's it take if you want to cut hair in Florida. How hard is it to just get your license to cut people's hair? 16 different individuals and bureaus and divisions would have to stamp it before you could cut hair. So, uh, so that's you know, that's an easy example, but but uh, but he is. Um, we're all reporting our, our reductions into him, 
and that number is that about 2,000 rules have been eliminated. Uh, and that's, that's called a good start. Uh, that's all. Yeah. And uh, from, so I would tell you that, that going in the privilege again you've given me, that this last year I asked the legislature to take 49 different types of insurance licenses and we consolidated them down to seven so that, that people weren't working through a maze of having to get, that, look, we can combine these two and if you're doing that, you're probably doing this, so just get one license and, and do them both. So we're all trying to work under that mindset, but he is really serious about this. And uh, that, that's excellent, John. Uh, I just want to make this, I go to a lot of the meetings with scripts, uh -huh. and they are just so happy because when they're looking for a specialist, a microbiologist, on intracellular metabolism for drug production, who has experience, there'll be a dozen of them in the world, and they will advertise, and they'll get applications from 10 of them to come to Florida. You know, they, they, being in Florida has just helped them recruit some of the hardest to get scientists. So that's the, that's the growth that Florida and Scripps are now doing. So it's great. Yes. Okay. How is the unemployment exception benefits for unemployment? Does that impact the state at all, as far as financially? No. The question was, does the unemployment extension impact the state? It, it does. It because it impacts the business enterprise itself. Yes. So that. Um, um, these are all bills that have to be paid, and um, and so we're talking really significant dollars that will over time be coming back out of a business tax. Well, that happened with us yeah. because um, I noticed they had a credit reduction, a credit reduction tax. Uh, <coughs> that, that has the state of the. Um, Borrowed the state of Florida, but it's borrowed money from the federal right. government. Right. And now we have, I, when I went to pay it today, I said, what do I have to do with $1 for that? Our company. So I was right. just curious. You had to borrow money from the government. Is that That's correct. That's correct. Is this, and we're paying interest on this money from the federal government? Or is it, how does that work? Yeah, but, um, but between, uh, that would be a, a de minimis amount of this whole transaction. There is an expectation that uh, that there is uh, a, uh, a a present value of the money, but that is going to be a very de minimis amount here. The the real concern is, and, I, and again, this is the balancing act that we run, is that the, with those extensions, that we're all in this. Okay, here we go, and but that still has to be paid back, and that comes back from the someone who's who's already working as hard as you can go to pay that back. It's very real. Yes? I do have a question for you on that uh, same line. <clears throat> can, I'm sure you have done this a number of times, but can you project the budget from 80 million to the next five years and for what those numbers are going to uh, ex expound out to? Yeah, sure we do. Um, and uh, what we chose to do, in fact, you, you wouldn't, I mean, you have to be a, a real geek. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not implying anything. <laughs> but in 06, and I was really glad we did this, we placed it, we placed it on the ballot because we were afraid that the few of us who wouldn't be around down the road, we'd like to hold other people accountable in the future. Would you like it embedded in your constitution that that to not only do you have to pass a budget, but you have to have a three-year plan. You have, to, you have to do three in advance so that the people can see what's coming, what you're about to do to them. Uh, and, uh, and so Florida uniquely has done that. And uh, so there's a requirement now, an exercise that we have to go through to look out for years. And, 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 and at this point, um, the, uh, I, I think what's, what I'm excited about is that we see that for the first time now in five years, that I look at, like you all would look at, uh, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm a banker by trade, so anytime I would sit with a small business owner, we would talk about top line revenue. Where's your top line revenue going? What's, what's, what's the momentum? What's your run rate? What's the pace at? And what's your expense rate, run rate at? And uh, everybody gets that. Uh, well, the state has top line revenue as well. The, what I always say though is, you actually had to create value to get top line revenue. You actually had to convince the marketplace to buy your product. The state just takes it from you. 
Uh, and, uh, and that's, that's if, if people don't think about when I take, when I extract that tax, I must provide a value and I must be the only one who can provide that value. If we would think about that, we wouldn't take it or we shouldn't take it. So to your question specifically, we, we would look out and what, what's nice in answering that question is we finally have the first time in, in five years, the run rate of revenue, the tax we're extracting from you, is exceeding the present run rate of expenses. So, but that doesn't mean that we should run it that way. It doesn't mean we should extract it that way. That we would still say, well, with that, can we pay down your debt? Can we reduce your taxes? Okay? And not just believe because we came in with a, a, uh, a run rate that was higher. So we're looking at probably that $70 billion now that would, will not be increasing um, at, at the same run rate of expense. It would probably will go to about uh, 70.5, uh, whereas we'll probably bring in about a billion dollars more in revenue this year because of the inspired hardworking effort of, of Floridians. And but you would probably see a growth rate of about half of that to go back towards uh, things that, that probably are now new infrastructure needs that have been delayed. Yeah, how can you predict next week when the Fed's paying $60 billion a day in money? Yeah, right. What's that going to do to your prediction a year from now when a trillion dollars of funny money has been printed? Yeah, right. Well, um, the I would tell you that the greatest challenge that Floridians have is not in Florida any longer. The greatest challenge that Floridians have in trying to persevere in a, in a rational, um, uh, with rational economics is, is burdened heavily now by our federal government. And that's a very, very sad commentary. But, uh, and I would say this, that only Washington could vote on a bill um, on New Year's Day and create higher taxes for 70%, 77% of all men, women, and children and call it the American Tax Relief Act. <laughs> <laughs> Only they could do that. And when in Florida, that's going to take $6.5 billion out of the wallets and small business wallets to go to Washington, six and a half billion dollars means um, someone else is going to lose a job. Someone's not going to buy the car. Someone's going to put off the washer for another year and the dryer um, or the improvements to the house or the roof. That's not going to have five dollars for a loaf of bread. Yeah, right. It's, well, well, that's a whole other point. Yeah, uh, uh, that's a whole, yeah, that's a whole other point. That 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 there we are in a place where where uh, you wouldn't ever want to be that uh, on, on the on the economic so well, I'm saying um, how does that affect your prediction well yeah well we're still having to work with you know uh, we're, we're not anticipating inflation running off the chart yet but that would be that would be a huge issue it, it hasn't yet and, and we're hoping that that this kind of it's all make-believe. Yeah, well, I'm not disagreeing with you with that. Well, um, yeah. Uh, think if you add it, uh, you have sixteen and a half trillion dollars of debt. Right. That's the one. That's what they're telling you. Oh, yeah. If, if you yeah. thought of the unfunded Medicaid, yeah. Medicare, and 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 Social Security, you're probably at eighty-five trillion. Seventy-five trillion. Yeah. And there is. You think how long would it take to unwind that? And you you you. Uh, it's not happening. Yeah, because grandchildren. It, only if the corrective action was taken immediately could your great grandchildren hope to see that that. 99% of Americans don't even know what a trillion is. Yeah, right. right. But they voted for the one. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Sorry. Yeah, thank you. First, I want to just thank you for coming. Sure. I just wanted to know if you had anything to say or any input uh, when FPL comes up with their rate increases and they need all this money. Citizens and all those other insurance companies. Yeah, right. The question was to uh, uh, oh, excuse me. The question was to maybe to the broader uh, cost of living. Um, 
And those are real. I mean, that, that's, that's really part of this whole equation because that's marketplace. How does the marketplace persevere under some of that? Um, you, you know, we have in this state what, um, what we call the Public Services Commission, that they're burdened with the responsibility of doing this analysis on um, are, it, are, are we getting the right return for the rate that's being, that's being charged? And so um, I, I don't know how to answer that other than that is, that's an analysis. I do not see the analysis. I, I do not participate in that analysis. It is a, it's a very real issue. That's what um, I wanted to know. Yeah, no, that is, that is how, the idea was is that a public service commission would take the politics out of right. the establishment of rate. So that, that um, you wouldn't be, people wouldn't be running for office that I promise to, to lower your electricity rates and the next person is saying, well, now I'm in a, in a, in a, in a brownout or a blackout all the time. And so the marketplace by those individuals who are, who are appointed by the governor sit with that responsibility to make those calls. Okay. That's how that works. Yes, not you have not, no, to do that. Not, not the legislature, not the governor, not the cabinet. That is strictly the Public Service Commission. Let's all give Jeff a big round. was outstanding. Thank you so much. We're just so happy you're able to come with us. Uh, let's give them one more round.